Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, beloved, <clears throat> let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God. And he that loveth not, he doesn't know God. Why? Because God is love. God is not an emotion. Love is not an emotion. God is not an emotion. You don't fall in and out of God. You know, some people say, well, I just fell in love. After a while, I just fell out of love. Well, then it wasn't the God kind of love. Because God's love, you just don't fall into. No, he, he is the power of the universe. And I think many times, as we've discussed these last few weeks, we have the wrong definition. We have an earthly definition of love. Oh, I just love ice cream. I just love going to the football games. I love my church. Well, we need to understand this, that God's love is pure, very pure, and it's the essence of what he is. And Ephesians 5.1 tells us that we are to be imitators of God in the same way that little kids will imitate their parents. We are to be imitators of our Father. And God acts in love. Always. You may say, well, it doesn't, act, it doesn't act too much like he likes the devil. Well, he's doing to the devil what he's doing to the devil because he loves you. It may, it may seem evil to the devil, but it's an act of love because God loves us and he cares for us. So we need to separate this earthly definition from the heavenly definition of what love is. In fact, we probably should get the idea of what love is out of our heads and start thinking about who love is. And thinking of love as an essence of this universe, the creator of this universe, who created us. If you stop and think about how small us is in the universe, just go to NASA's website sometime and you'll find out that we have the earth and then you have the planets. And most of them are bigger than the earth. Then you have the sun. Then you have other suns and other suns. You, there are places in the universe that are so large that our minds can't comprehend it. You know, the Hubble telescope focused on an area of space, a small spot in space where there was nothing. They could see nothing. And they focused on it for several months. And what they discovered is in that one little speck of space, and I'm not talking about they just put their telescope out there and, and looked at space as a whole. No, just one little, what we would call a dot in space where they couldn't see anything. And they found trillions of stars, billions of galaxies, many of them much larger than the Milky Way. So for God to love us, we're not, even, we're not even a speck of dust in space compared to everything else that God created. But he loved us. He created us in his image, in his likeness. Now that's love. 
And he loved us so much that he sent a part of himself to literally die as a man on this earth so that we could spend all eternity with him. Now that's an act of love. Because he didn't love us when we were all born again and righteous by the blood of Jesus. He loved us before that. And he tells us that we're supposed to love in the same way that he loves. Now, when you think about your grouchy next-door neighbor who puts his leaves over into your yard, who, well, we won't go into everything he does. You're supposed to love him. Now, does that mean that you put up with stuff? No, you don't put up with stuff, but you still love him. How much? How much do you love him? Almost as much as God loves? Maybe half as much as God loves him? No, you, you have to love him as much as God loves him. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for a friend. Well, love is powerful, isn't it? Sometimes we don't want to think about how much we're supposed to love because it requires action. It requires us to not be complacent. It requires us to do something. See, love is not silent. Romans 12.10, I'm going to give you some scriptures and then we'll move on here for a little bit. Be kindly and affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Now, kindly and affectionate to one another. I, I went to a church one time and this man stood at the front door and he tried to kiss every woman on the lips as she came in. True story. <laughs> and he went to the pastor. I wasn't the pastor, but he went to the pastor and he says, he says, man, they're just all pushing me away and slapping at me. He said, I'm just trying to do what the Scripture says. I'm trying to be affectionate. Well, it says with brotherly love. I grew up with a sister. I ain't kissing her on the lips. That's what I'm telling you. No, brotherly love. What's brotherly love? That, that means you overlook a lot of stuff. In my many decades of ministry, I've, I've dealt with a lot of families that have had something go wrong. And, and, you know, sisters will stand by brothers and brothers will stand by sisters and brothers with brothers and sisters with sisters when the world wouldn't. But because of that love that's in their heart, it's my brother. It's my sister. There's just something there. Well, we need to have something inside of us, not something that we pretend See, there's a lot of pretend love. You know, you've heard of fake news? Well, there's fake love. There's a lot of people acting all sweet and syrupy sometimes when they're, when they're in the house of God. You don't want to be one of those people because that's not godly. That, that's not walking in love. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor of giving preference to one another. So that means that you don't push yourself ahead of somebody else. We would say it this way. Be polite. Be kind. Romans 14, 15 says, Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. In other words, don't purposefully offend somebody. If there's something that you do in your life and you know it offends somebody, don't get up in their face and do it. Don't provoke someone. You know, the, the Bible talks about fathers not provoking their kids. Well, as adults, we are not supposed to provoke each other. Well, I'm just going to put my leaves over in his yard. 
I'll show him a thing or three. We'll see how he likes it. Let me tell you something. Love is the power that enables us to comprehend the depth of God. There are people looking for revelation in their life. They're looking for revelation in the Word. They, they want to know something deeper. And, and they go to, to Greek classes and Hebrew classes and theology school and all these different things, and these are good. But if you don't have love in your heart, you cannot comprehend the deep things of God. You can't. And I can prove it by Scripture. And it's a Scripture that everybody reads all the time. But they possibly miss this one little line. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Which, by the way, you need to understand, you have family in heaven. You know, when, when your family passes, somebody in your family passes, they don't leave your family. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, the family of God, that we would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit, in the inner man. Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, okay, now catch this, being rooted and grounded in love. Comma. May be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, and depth and height, to whom the love of Christ which passes all knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You want to comprehend the depth and the width and the height of God? You want to be filled with all the fullness of God? Then you've got to be rooted and grounded in love. Now, Christians... This should be the thing that sets us apart from the rest of the world. Jesus, when he sent out his, his ministry team, he had 35 groups of two. They refer to him in the Bible as the 70, but he sent them out two by two, and he sent them out to towns and villages that he was going to show up at. I know I ended a sentence with a preposition there. I apologize. <laughs> but he, he, he sent out these 35 groups to prepare for his showing up. Why do you think it is that everybody kind of knew when Jesus was going to show up? It's because he sent his ministry team out in advance. And they would say, the Messiah is coming to wherever, Capernaum. And he's going to be here in 10 days. And Jesus gave them instructions when they went out. And he said, he said to them, if they don't accept you, you kick the dust off your shoes, your sandals, and you just move on. He didn't say argue with them. He didn't say get in conflict with them. He didn't say stay and debate and try to convince them. Why? Because generally these things don't work. I don't know if you've ever been on social media and you've been in an argument with somebody that believes the opposite of you. And when the argument's all over, all that's been accomplished is just both of you are mad. Because they don't convince you and you don't convince them. But Jesus, in talking with his disciples, he said, here's how they're going to know that you are my disciples. Here's how they're going to know. Here's, here's going to be the thing that separates you from the rest of the world and puts you into the group where they're going to say, boy, they must be following Christ, the Messiah. 
What's going to separate them? He says, they will know you are mine by the love that you have for each other. So that meant when the two went out to a place, they don't get in a fist fight in front of everybody. They don't get into an argument. They're kind to each other. They walk in love. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you've ever traveled with anybody or not. Has anybody ever traveled with someone a great distance? Test your love sometimes when you do that. Colossians 3.19, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Hmm. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Now, I just... Saw Amos put his arm around Roma. I glanced over and he smiled at her and she smiled back. And hopefully she's not thinking, why are you being so nice to me? <laughs> no, I think they love each other. But you know, this it, it can be a test. Okay. The Bible says if there's anything that offends people that you shouldn't do it. So I'm going to quit talking about that. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Right? Don't be bitter towards someone that you're supposed to love. What, what's bitter? What kind of a face do you make when you taste something bitter? Don't have that attitude. Toward your wife. John, you listening up? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. What is your motive to love? Well, the Bible says I have to. <laughs> well, that shouldn't be your motive to love. You know, you shouldn't love because God's going to spank you if you don't. No. See, some people get it reversed instead of loving other people they want everybody to love them are, are you following me and in order to get someone to love you sometimes they use manipulation and control have you ever felt manipulated somebody now now don't get me wrong depression is a real thing it is a real thing but some people are not depressed, but they fake depression in order to get sympathy. See, that, that doesn't prove love. Some people get jealous or they act jealous. Jealousy isn't love. They're two different words. Jealousy, love, they're two different things. And sometimes people are jealous, not because they love, it's just because they're a possessive person. See, manipulation and control, it's based on fear. See, perfect love, remember we talked about this last week, perfect love casts out fear. And if you have perfect love towards someone, you're not going to be fearful of what might happen. And you do need to understand this. You, you cannot control other people. If somebody else is an idiot and a jerk and they're committing adultery on you, you can beat them if you want to, but that's not going to stop it. That doesn't solve the problem. The only person that you are in control of is you. And you need to realize that. You are the supreme controller of you. 
Some people are saying, well, if God wants me to do it, he'll just make you do it. you got to get that thought out of your head. God's not going to make you do anything. He's going to tell you what he likes in his word. He's going to show you his example, but he will not make you do anything. In fact, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, you'll see the fruit of the Spirit. This is what God places in you when you become born again. And it's love, joy, peace. There's nine parts to that fruit. And the last one is a big deal. The very last one, number nine, if you look it up in verse 23, is self-control. Oh, God, just, just use me. Use me. No, God's saying, you use you. Do something. See, too often we, we put all the burden back onto God and say, well, if God wants me to do it, he, he'll just... He'll make a way. No, 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 no. He'll tell you what to do. He said, well, the door was closed. I couldn't go that way. The door was closed. Well, I'm not going to say the name. I started to say Forrest. But, <laughs> you know, McFly, if God told you to go that direction and the door is closed, kick the door down. It has nothing to do with whether there's a door open or whether there's a door closed. Too many people say, well, you know, God's going to guide me and I'm, he's just going to make a way. Well, God makes a way, but the way he makes the way is he empowers you so that you can do what he wants done. See, he doesn't say, I can do all things through you who strengthens you. He says, no, you can do all things through me. You can do all things through me. If I tell you to do something, quit looking around. You walk by faith and not by sight. You don't walk by the circumstances. You don't, you don't do what you do based on what you see. You do what you do based upon what he said. And it doesn't matter if there's 25 doors, one right after another. If he said, go that way, you just walk, start walking toward the doors. Well, what happens when I get to the doors? He will empower you so that you can do what you normally couldn't do. Those doors will come down or you'll, he may have a work around around those doors, whatever. God will guide you, be led by the Spirit, and do what he says to do. See, obeying God is the greatest example of expressing love for him. One time he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I tell you to do? Come on. If you love me, keep my commandments. I mean, those are his words. I'm telling you what to do. And here you are going around, Lord, we love you, and you don't even do what I tell you to do. You say, well, I went there, but... <sighs> There was a sea there. Well, put your foot in the water and I'll part the sea. Thank you. All right, men, you know I told you to love your wives. You got that, Steve, didn't you? You got that? Okay. All right. Because if she's watching... Titus 2.4, admonish the young women to love their husbands. Wow, it goes both ways. And to love their children. Hmm. 1 Corinthians 13.1, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, what does that mean? That means whether you speak in your native language or you're speaking by the Holy Spirit. Either way. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. A clanging cymbal. 
In other words, you can speak the oracles of God with your mouth in your known language. You can speak in the heavenly language. But if you don't have love, here's how it's going to come out. Blah, 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 blah. And no one's going to hear it. Or if they hear it, they won't believe it. Because you are not walking in love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, oh boy. So this means that you could be a prophet? I've met some prophets. And I've, I've met some losses. <laughs> And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, how many mysteries do you understand? Oh, man, I, I understand all these mysteries. I've studied what God's written down. I understand the mysteries. And all knowledge, and though I have all faith, in other words, I believe God. What's faith? Faith is believing God. Man, I believe God. Yes, I know the mysteries, and I walk in faith, and I've got the knowledge. I've got so much faith that I could move mountains. But if I don't have love, according to the Scripture, I am nothing. Zero. Zip. Nothing. How would you like for God to say, you're nothing. But I, I've studied your word. I've got faith. I, man, I can, I can even do miracles. I can, I can do all this stuff. But God will say, but you don't have love. If you don't have love, you don't have me. See, so never forget, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, God is love. It doesn't say God walks in love, which he does. It doesn't say he likes love. No, he is love. And that's kind of beyond what our brains can even comprehend. But here's the deal. Without love, you can't comprehend anything. You may have knowledge, but you don't comprehend it. Have you ever met somebody who knew something but didn't comprehend what they knew? I mean, they know something, but they're but they're not acting on their knowledge. They didn't comprehend. Kind of like going to algebra class. You may know it, but you don't get it. And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me what? nothing you don't get any gold stars for doing it if you don't do it in love how important is the love of God nothing really counts unless you do it in love you can have one of the biggest benevolent organizations in the world you could have money so much money I won't say his name but there was a gentleman not too long ago that gave away 32 billion dollars to another man who had more than that so that they could do benevolent stuff with it. Well, you can give $32 billion to feed the poor, but if you don't have love, there's no gold star for you anywhere. It's nothing. Nothing. Love suffers long. <laughs> Boy, don't you just love the King James style of English? Love is patient. I've heard people say, I've been in love with this man for all these years and I've suffered a long time. <laughs> that's, that's not what it's talking about. <laughs> it's, that's not what it, no, come on. Love is patient. What is patience? 
patience is sitting quietly while the pastor preaches. <laughs> it's as simple as not blowing up and throwing a fit because the car in front of you didn't start up when the light turned green quick enough. I've been with people. The light turns green. The car in front of them doesn't move. And they say all kinds of things and hit the steering wheel and yell inside the car. And I think, well, just give them two seconds. Patience. Patience is a, is a virtue. Patience is people. If you want people to love you, if you want people to want to be around you, then practice some patience. I'll just tell you something. Nobody wants to be around an impatient person. If you're all the time flying off the handle because every little thing, because you, you can't wait. Now, I'll, I'll be honest. Sitting in the license bureau for an hour and 20 minutes, that's a little tough sometimes. Now, I don't know if this guy was a Christian or not. It's totally irrelevant. But he'd been waiting there evidently longer than me, and he got up and said a few words and left. Choice words he spoke. And he had a very impatient <laughs> attitude. Now, here's the deal. If you do that and people know you're a Christian, they'll use that against you. And it's not you that they condemn, but pff, there's one of those church people, man. They, they're no different than us. In fact, they'll say, I even have more patience than they do. You've got to remember that when you are in the world, you're not of the world, but you're, you're out there in it. And when you're in the world, the world sees Jesus through you. And the way you act, if, if you're going around with, you got a cross around your neck and you got a, a, a church lapel pin and, and you got Jesus loves you on the side of your baseball cap and every, people are watching you. And if you act like a fool, it just pushes them further away. Now, if you've got a baseball cap with Jesus loves you on the dash of your car, I did not see it as I came into church today, and I'm not talking about you. <laughs> okay. Love is patient and is kind. It's kind. Now, kind <clears throat> doesn't mean that you're kind to people who are kind to you. Jesus even said that. We may read that later. We may not. But he said, he said, you know, even tax collectors like tax collectors. I mean, if they all hang out together, you know. You've got to show love and be kind to people who are not like you. Too many illustrations there. I can't go on. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely and does not seek its own. You know, all that can pretty well be summed up into one thing. Love doesn't walk in pride. There's a big difference between pride and love. You can be proud of your child, and that's not the same as loving your child. In fact, loving your child will bring peace. Pride in your child sometimes will bring violence. Have you ever seen on television soccer matches between two countries. And one country is wearing their colors in the stands. 
and the other country is wearing their colors in the stands. Now, I have a granddaughter who uh, plays soccer. She's practiced with the U.S. women's soccer team and all that down in Costa Rica. And she's uh, on the soccer team at uh, a Division I school, Marquette University. But uh, I've seen soccer on television where the stands would empty, and later the newscaster would say four people were trampled to death, 16 people were in the hospital, and they're fighting each other. Now, how do they know who to fight? Well, the guy is wearing the, I, I'll just pick out odd colors, the guy is wearing the, the green and tan clothing at the game or fighting with all the people wearing the blue and yellow clothing, and it doesn't matter who they are, just if you've got the other team's colors on, I'm going to, I'm going to, what is that? That's pride. That's pride. See, we, there, there's no such thing as good pride. <clears throat> People say, well, I don't have that, the evil kind of pride. <laughs> there isn't. That's like saying, I don't have bad adultery. I just got the good kind. Now, pride is always evil. God hates pr pride. It says he pushes the proud aside. So we almost need to get it out of our language. I've heard people say, well, I'm really proud of this church. No, 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 don't be proud of this church because if you're proud of this church, you're going to think this church is better than that church. See, if you have pride in your children, well, let's just put it this way. All of those things we just read, parading itself, being puffed up, behaving rudely, seeking your own, provoked, pride is involved with all of those things. And um, I really don't have time to explain all that right now. In fact, at one time, I think I did eight weeks on pride because pride has entered into the church. And once pride enters in, love gets pushed out and you start being happy and pleased with your self-accomplishments rather than some other things. I love our worship team, and I, I'm going to say that. Our worship team, I love them with the love of God. I love our worship team. Our worship team uh, is just amazing when it comes to going into the place of God. But I have seen worship teams where they were more concerned about how they looked and how they, how they performed and it was like presenting themselves rather than presenting the Lord. Are, are you following me? And that can be done. And it can slip in real easy. And that's what I, I am so thankful. Loretta and I have talked about this many times, about how blessed we are to have a worship team. That I mean, you should be at the practices. You know, you, you need to be around them. They, they, they are constantly lifting up the Lord. They pray together. It, it truly is a worship team. It's not a band. Nobody's really concerned about getting famous. They're concerned about worshiping the Lord. See? But I've seen worship teams get over into the performance area to where the performance is more important than who we're worshiping. See, that can be in every part of life. That can be in every part of the church, not just a worship team. Love does not seek its own, is not provoked. It thinks no evil. See, when, when somebody mentions a name, the first thing that comes to your mind should not be the evil that they have done the first thing that comes to your mind is, is there anything I can do to win this person over to Jesus? 
Does that mean that they didn't do the thing that they did? No, it doesn't give them a pass on that. And it doesn't mean that you have to hang out with an evil person. But let me remind you, we live in the world. We're not of the world, but we're in the world. See, one of the greatest expressions of love that I, I know of in, in this church is Chris over there, Chris Stevens. Back there holding the baby. You know, when he was speaking here at the church a, a while back, he made the comment that most of the time when he goes to speak, he's, he's behind wire, behind a fence. I mean, he, he goes into the prisons. Why would somebody do that? Those people in jail, they just deserve it. Now, wait a minute. Those people in jail got caught for something that probably you've done and you didn't get caught. You don't, know their, you don't know their history. You don't know their life story. Yes, there are some horribly evil people in prison. And there's, but there's, everyone in prison is just like everybody in church. We all need Jesus. And we're going nowhere without, you know, and, and so we can't have the attitude of thinking evil of everybody that's in prison. Are, are you following me? I'm not saying you got to go, I'm going to go to prison and just be one of the prisoners. No. What, but what I am saying is, an act of love would be showing support for somebody who does do it. See? You may say, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't really, I, I love the people in Ghana, but I, I really don't want to go there. There's nothing really I can do in Ghana. Well, yeah, you can support, help support our missionary from the church that goes to Ghana. Or Karen. Or like the other night, Cassie. I mean, when you support people that are going places, what, what are you doing when you support missions? I love missions. But what are you doing when you support missions? You're showing your love. See, your money represents the most precious thing that you have on this earth, next to the Lord, of course. And that's your time. You only have so much time. You don't know necessarily when your time's up but you only have so much time. And how do you get your money? You go to a place of employment and you exchange your time for money. You go to a place, you say, look, I'll give you 40 hours this week and you give me $500. Okay? So what you have just done is you sold 40 hours of your life. You sold it. Gave it away for $500. Are you following me? So that money is not just money to spend. It's, it represents the essence of you. It, it, it represents who you are. It, it's your time. It's your life. See, money is just not money. It represents something. So when you give money into missions, you're actually, or into the church or wherever, you're actually giving a portion of your life. That same person, if they worked five, 40 hours and, and got $500 and they gave $500 to the building fund here at the church, they gave, I don't look at it as $500, I look at it this way, they gave 40 hours of their life to the building fund. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. See, the love of God, when, when we do what God wants, and I say this metaphorically to a degree, but it puts a smile on God's face when you do what he wants you to do. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So, if you think you're a failure in life, just remember this, walk in love and you won't be because love never fails. Hebrews 10, 24, 
Let us consider Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. When you are considerate, that will help stir up the love. You know, all of these things, patience, kindness, you may say, I just don't have it in my heart to be patient and to be kind right now. Well, do it anyway. Do it anyway. Because the Scripture tells us that when we consider one another, it helps to stir up the love. Dub in some applause there, Jim. <laughs> Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? Hmm. Now, in closing, I wrote down some thoughts. And let me say this. We could talk about love for the next, well, until the rapture takes place. Because you never exhaust this subject. And these five weeks that we've talked about love really are nothing more than just a, a catalyst, something to get you to thinking about the love of God and what love really is. But I, I've got some closing thoughts here. One thing that really hit me strong is we cannot keep going back to the world's definition of love when we're talking about love. You know, some people say, well, we made love last night. No, you had sex last night. Boy, it got quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's back there saying, no, I didn't. <laughs> That's sad. Okay. <laughs> Sex is physical. Love is God, and it's of the heart. Are you following me? Or are you getting it? <laughs> At this point, I am not calling out any names of anybody. <laughs> Remember, remember the, the message that I taught, uh, Mark Eric inspired it. It was called, uh, What You Know Versus What You Believe. And we talked about how you, you can know something and not believe it. You know it. You know it's true, but you don't believe it. And the problem there is you always act on what you believe, not on what you know. You always act on what you believe and not on what you know. And our typical example on that is everyone in the world knows that smoking will kill you. But if you smoke, you may know that, but you don't believe it. Are you following me? So you've got to act on what you believe, but you've got to believe what you know. And as Christians, one of our biggest problems is we don't necessarily believe what we know. And I gave you some knowledge these last five weeks out of the Word of God, and, and you know it because you know that God doesn't lie. Hebrews 6.18, Titus 1.2, God does not lie. What he says is true. And I quoted what he said. And you know it. But now, do you really believe it? He said that if you don't love, you don't know him. He that does not love does not know God. Because God is love. So we got to start acting on what we believe only when what we believe lines up with what we know. You know 
that God loves you. I mean, come on. God loves you. You know that. Then if you know that God loves you, and I say this probably to other places more than to here, if you know that God loves you, why in the world would you think that God put that sickness on you to teach you something? If you know that God loves you, why would you think that God took you down just because you can't look up until you're flat on your back? God is a good God. James 1.17 says, every good and every perfect gift comes from him. God is a good God. You know, many, many years ago, many decades ago, Oral Roberts got into a lot of trouble with preachers because he had a sermon and a theme that God is a good God and the devil's a bad devil. And who would think that that would raise up any problems? I mean, God's a good God, and but people say, well, wait a minute, and People actually argued with him. Theologians argued with him. Well, look what God did. He sent David in to kill all those people in that village. And, and look what God did. He, he put all those things on Job. And, and look what God did. He, he put all that sickness. And look what all the, all the disciples, they all, all except John, they all died horrible deaths. And God's in control of everything. And, and so why did God do all that if he's so good? Can you believe someone would think that way? Well, here's what a lot of people don't realize. God's not in control. You are. All authority has been given to you. He said, all authority has been given to me, and I give you authority over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. You can, do all, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you to do what you couldn't normally do. The fruit of the Spirit, self-control. He never said, submit yourself to me and I'll control you. No, he said, you, you, let, you let my Spirit come into you and here's the fruit of the Spirit. You will have self-control. What is self-control? That means you control yourself. And you quit blaming God for stuff that happens. You say, well, why did God do this to me? So God put you in that situation, huh? I can feel the love coming. Right now. It's probably a good time to stop. You know, the, uh, I've told this story many, many times, but I'm just going to tell it one time in closing here. It's not very long. Remember the Space Shuttle Challenger? Does anybody, how many of you are old enough to remember that? What, what year did that happen? 1980, 80 when? 86, somewhere there around, about. We had a space shuttle that went up into space. It was being broadcast on national television you know it was back in the 1986 that was back before the internet was invented Al, Al Gore hadn't done it yet so uh, did you know the in internet only came into existence one year before our church started and that the year our church started Wi-Fi did not even exist oh it's amazing how things have progressed but the space shuttle was going up into space, and all the television cameras were on it, and then all of a sudden it exploded. And everyone on it died, and it was all over the news. And I had a lady who was a nun in some, I, I don't understand all of the Catholic terminology, but in some diocese or something in St. Louis, whatever. But she, she wrote me a letter, and she, sa and she said, I have two questions. One, why did God blow up the space shuttle? Or, number two, if he didn't blow it up, why did he allow it to happen? Well, that's a loaded question. That's kind of like saying, do you still beat your wife? You know, there's no answer to that. No, I don't beat her anymore. Or, yes, I do. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no answer to that that makes you look good. <laughs> so... Um, 
At any rate, and I wrote her back and I said, neither one of those. God didn't blow up the space shuttle and he didn't allow it. She contacted me back and she said, well, then who did? I said, the church. Who's in charge on this earth? Who's, who's, who's in charge of your life? You. You are, you're to be led by the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? We are to be led by the Holy Spirit. We, it's not that the Holy Spirit just moves us. He moves us by leading us, and then we do what he says to do. Is this making sense to anybody? So love, oh, this is a section that I skipped. I probably shouldn't have. I'm just going to tag it on here. Love doesn't blame other people. And love doesn't blame God. That's kind of like love blaming love, you know. You can't blame God. God is the essence of all goodness. And, uh, you know, some things may just be as simple as this. The guy that made that O-ring on Friday may have wanted to get off the job quick, and that O-ring was the O-ring that broke in the space shuttle that caused it to blow up. You say, well, that's just human error. You're right. Human error, not God error. So Jesus went to be with the Father, and he said, when I go to be with the Father, he will send his Spirit to be here with you in my name. He's going to send, he's going to send his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to be here with you. We've got to understand God's a three-part being. The Father and the Son are in heaven right now. I know this is simplistic, but the Holy Spirit's on, here on this earth, and he is in the church. And we are the ones, we are the ones who's in charge of the earth right now. Wow. You say, well, why is the world in such a mess? What's the state of the church? If the body of Christ would rise up and do what the body of Christ is supposed to do, the earth would be a little different than what it is right now. All right, let's stand. All right, put your hand on your chest and say this, I make this commitment before God. To live my life walking in the love of God. I will do what he says to do. I will not do what he says not to do. And I will show his love through my life. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you all, all the praise. And we thank you for loving us with a love that is so pure that the only way we can comprehend it is to walk in that love ourselves. We love you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen.